If you'd like to take your Bibles and join me in the book of Matthew, chapter 2. When I was getting dressed this morning, Ann asked me if I was going to wear uh, lion's colors or packer's colors. That's a tough one. So I wore my wise man tie. And... Uh, going to enjoy every aspect of the game. So, Let's read about the wise men. We're going to begin at verse 1. We're going to look at the first 12 verses. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and the scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. And they told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler, who will shepherd my people Israel. Well, then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go, search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way, and behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them, until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and they worshipped him. Then, opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. Let's pray, shall we? Heavenly Father, I pray that uh, the richness of this portion of Scripture would not be lost on us this morning, Lord. For we believe that uh, your word is a treasure trove of wisdom and guidance. Lord, I pray that we would glean from it all that you have for each one of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, There's so much going on in this portion of Scripture, especially personally. One of my favorite storylines has to do with Herod and the nature of his evil and the deceptive ways that he practices. We're not going to spend any time on that today. We have in the past, but I'm sure that I will again someday if the Lord tarries. Uh, I want you to think about this. In Paul's first letter to the church in Corinth, from which we just read before we took communion, In the very first chapter, in verse 26, we read this. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. See how many of you I'm describing here? Okay. (laughs) Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God has chosen what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. And God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. And God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to, bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. Now this is certainly a true observation, and I'm sure we have all seen this to be true, uh, regarding the church in Recutting the church in the times in which we live, and certainly in the church in Corinth. But not many of them were wise, powerful, of noble birth. But this, and, and like I say, the same is true in most churches. However, today's scripture gives testimony that God does use some who are wise and are powerful and are of noble birth to bring his message of salvation to the world. In fact, we saw this in the early church as members of uh, the Roman aristocracy were some of the first to embrace the Christian faith, and then eventually the emperor himself. Here we have the Magi, wise men 
is a translation, if, uh, and I think, if, I think the RESV says wise men. If you have the NIV, they use a transliteration of the Greek word, which is magoi, or magi. And, uh, and th- we don't know very much about them. If you study what is a magi, and you go out through our history, magi are in the Old Testament, some in the New Testament, but they have a various range of skills and talents and things that they do. Uh, from divination to astronomy to the sciences to healing ministries. Uh, And uh, we know very little about the background of these particular magi other than they were the stargazers. And they they were students. We know that they were studied men. Um, we We know that there was more than one of them but we don't know how many there were. So if you have a nativity at home and you lose one of the three wise men, you're okay, okay? <laughs> or, but if you lose two of the three, you gotta go shopping, all right? <laughs> Actually, they shouldn't even be there, frankly. They, uh, we'll look at that in a minute. Uh, but if you have several nativities, you can put all the wise men together and have 12 of them if you want. It really, that's okay. We know that they were wise. Why do we know that they were wise? Well, due to the nature of their words and actions, we know that they were wise. We're not exactly sure from whence they came, only that they came from the east, east of Jerusalem. Most scholars believe that they came from Persia. We're not even sure when they came, only that they came after Jesus had been born and before King Herod ordered the death of all children under the the age of two hoping to take the life of this newborn king. We know that the Holy Family, Mary, Joseph, and Jesus, were no longer in the stable when the wise men arrived. They were living in a house by that time. And we know that these men had access to ancient writings which had prophesied the birth of this Jewish king. Uh, Perhaps even... Some speculate the writings of Daniel, who had been the head magi for the entire nation of Babylon. We know their presence in the city of Jerusalem caused quite a stir. Uh, And when directed to Herod the king, they were granted access to Herod the king. Their presence and their question that they asked when they came was troubling to Herod, and if you knew Herod, any time Herod was troubled, everybody around him was troubled. Uh, they knew that a king for the Jewish people had been born, and even as Gentiles, because these men were not Jewish, they had been led to worship this Jewish king, which is an amazing thing in and of itself. Not Herod, mind you, but this newborn king, Herod Uh, really didn't like the idea of this newborn king that people were going to worship. Uh, And if you were trying to figure out the words, well, then why did he want to worship him? Well, he didn't want to worship him. He was a liar and a murderer is what he was. Well, we know that they followed what is described as a star which came to rest over the home where the Holy Family was living. And there have been a lot of explanations as to the nature of this star. Johannes Kepler, who was the father of modern astronomy uh, and a believer, he, uh, he decided that the star, who he believed that the star from his studies was a conjunction of the planets Jupiter and Saturn in the constellation of Pisces, uh, and that the event happened in the year of 7 BC. Uh, That's commonly accepted by many. Uh, I will tell you that I personally don't think that makes much sense. The timing is off. And and this star, in my mind, was more likely a miraculous phenomena that God placed in the skies in order to lead the wise men. It never made sense to me that stars so far up in the sky could come to rest over a single household that would direct the people following it to that single household and actually creating such a light in the sky, somewhat like the Shekinah glory that the Israels uh, followed in the wilderness. 
Uh, that, would, that is nothing difficult for our God of miracles. He certainly could have done it, and it would have been child's play for him. Uh, but that would seem to me to be the only rational argument to explain how that star could rest over a single residence. Uh, to me personally, I find it interesting that Matthew shows very little interest in explaining the detailed aspects of this historical account about which students of the word are very curious. Guys like me, I read accounts like this and it leaves me with far more questions than answers. And that, you know, well, what about this? And what about this? And what about this? And what about this? And Matthew goes, eh, you know. Uh, if it were important, I would have told you, I think the Lord would want us to say, but I want to know how many there were. I even want to know what their names were. I want to know where they were from. I would like to do a study about the background and the motivations of people who come from the part of the world that these men came from. I want to know more about how they knew what they knew. What were their names? When exactly did they travel and arrive in Jerusalem and then to Bethlehem? Well, those things don't seem to be important to Matthew. But what does seem to be important to Matthew is probably what should be important to us. He seems to want us to know that the Gentiles were among some of the first people to worship Jesus. Now, that might not mean much to you if you are Jewish. And we usually have a number of people here who have a Jewish heritage. But uh, in Baraboo, Wisconsin, most of us are Goyim. Okay, and uh, we, I have Jewish friends and, who are not Christians, and I said, hey, I worship a Jew. You guys, <laughs> you guys need to get on board here. And, uh, and, and, uh, but these were some of the very first people who bowed before Jesus as their king. But he also seems to want us to know about the nature of the gifts that they offered to this infant king. So let's talk about the gifts for a moment. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Gold is a gift that is appropriately given and associated with royalty. If you show up in a king's residence and you bring him a gift, one would expect there to be gold included in that gift. Thus, the kingship of Jesus is underscored by the nature of this gift. We know that Jesus' kingship was going to be like no other kingship that had ever existed before, nor will ever exist again. Jesus' kingdom would be, would be spiritual. It would not be of this earth. The kingdoms of this earth are paltry little kingdoms that come and go. Jesus' kingdom would be eternal in nature. Jesus' entire ministry would emphasize the kingdom of God that was coming and, in another sense, already there because the king had come. And he was establishing his king kingdom, which would be established in the hearts of those who follow him. And we pointed this out last week. If you are a leader, would you rather have... Uh, people do what you say just because they fear you, or would you rather have them do what you say because they love you and their hearts are in agreement with you? Yeah, love and hearts. That is where the power is, okay? Uh, anyway, Jesus would be mocked as king of the Jews, a title he refused to deny, and, was, and that was written on a sign and placed on the Roman cross upon which he was crucified. It was written in several languages, so there was no mistaking it. That's something Pilate had done. Jesus was, is, and always will be the king of all kings and the lord of all lords. And as king, he should be obeyed and served by all of his subjects. Christians are his subjects, people who choose to be his subject, people that he calls, this is the old uh, Arminian versus Calvinism thing that I've never really had a problem with. You probably know me well enough to know that I believe God chooses us, but I believe we choose God. There, it's over, okay? <sighs> Wish it were that easy. Uh, get theologians in the middle of thing and things get all, well, never mind. Uh, 
but needs to be obeyed. And uh, we should serve him. Gold also, in a practical sense, was a universally traded form of currency, just in case the Holy Family needed to fund a last-minute trip, say, maybe to Egypt. Okay? That is also in play here. The next gift was frankincense. When mixed with oil, frankincense became an aromatic perfume that was mixed with, in the temple, meal offerings. And uh, meal offerings were not uh, animals. They were offerings that were offered always in praise and thanksgiving, not offered up around dead animals. Uh, they were part of the sacrificial system that spoke of life. The priests were also anointed with this perfume before they performed their sacrificial duties. And the aromatic scents of perfume make the priests and that which they sacrificed a sweet-smelling sacrifice to God. Jesus is our high priest. This is what the book of Hebrews emphasizes throughout. All that he does in and through us is pleasant and acceptable to God. Everything that Jesus does and his spirit does in and through us is pleasing and acceptable to God. Frankincense, when that aroma hit the senses, brought to mind worship, the worship of God. And then the third gift, myrrh. Myrrh is a strong aromatic resin that is used in a number of different ways, but primarily in preparation of bodies for their burials. The smell of myrrh brought to mind death and dead bodies. When Nicodemus took Jesus' body to the tomb, he took with him a hundred pounds of myrrh and aloe. Okay, a hundred pounds of myrrh and aloe. Myrrh was also used as a crude anesthetic that could deaden pain. You may remember that when Jesus was dying on the cross, he refused a drink of wine mixed with myrrh. He sought no relief from the pain of the cross. Now these gifts of the Magi were prophetic. It's part of the way that great grand meta-narrative of God ties all truth together in him. Gold for the baby who would be born king of the kings to an all-powerful ruler who would reign in the hearts of his people, a king born to rule in grace and mercy and justice and truth, and has been reigning in the hearts of his people now for over 2,000 years and will continue to rule in the hearts of his people for eternity. Frankincense for a great high priest whose work of sacrifice would be assuaged with the wrath of God for a sinful world. A perfect high priest who would give himself up as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of many. And then myrrh, for the one who was born to die, whose death would be the only sacrifice which would be pleasing and acceptable to God. Born to die, so that the faithful could live forever with him in glory. Now, one other thing I want to touch on. I want to make sure I can see the clock. Good. Okay. Do we know why the wise men were called wise men? Because the word in the Greek is magi or magi. Well, the wise men were called wise men because they were wise men. Makes a short essay, doesn't it? <laughs> there were many magi who knew much, but unwisely served foolish, foolishly with regard to men and not God. In other words, the world at that time was full of wise men, uh, was full of magi, but not all of them were wise. These men from the East proved themselves to be wise, and this is what we must consider because of these lessons of wisdom that we can pull from them are the greatest lessons of this, of this historical account. 
And I want to leave you with this. Wise people seek God. The wise seek after God. God had somehow informed them of the birth of Jesus, and when they first heard of him, they were a long way off. Some of you, when you first heard of Jesus, were a long way from him, at least in your own minds and hearts. And they needed to drastically change their plans in order to find him. Some of you, some of us, are and were a long way off when we heard of him, and we needed to drastically change our modus operandi in order to find him. These men studied, they looked for divine signs, they left their homes, they traveled afar, all the time believing that Jesus could be found. At great cost, they diligently sought him. I would say anyone here who has never found Jesus, do anything to find him. Because he will bring you into the harms of his father, God. If we have Jesus, we have God the Father, and the Spirit ties us together with him. Sometimes I think we in the church try to make finding salvation through Christ too easy for people. And in doing so, we cheapen him and weaken the person looking. There are certain people in the room, I really need you to listen carefully to this. Salvation isn't meant to be always easy peasy, okay? There is value in the journey and the struggle. And we don't often leave room for the difficult journey that many will make in order to find him. Too many uh, times I think we look like fools to the world, dancing up and down, saying, here he is, here he is, I've got him, I'll show him to you, here he is. It's not that easy, because they can't hear you. And they, can't, they, can, they can hear you, but they can't hear him and they can't see him yet. And we use verbiage like, all you have to do is pray this prayer. Oh, really? Is Christianity an incantation? All you got to do is just start coming to church. You'll be fine. Be part of the church. You'll be safe. Oh, really? <laughs> or... Just start doing these things that he wants you to do, and that will make God happy with you, and he'll let you into heaven. It's not what we do that gets us into heaven. It's what he did for us in our acceptance of that, and he even gives us the ability to accept him. We can't even do that by ourselves. We have to seek him with a diligent heart. In my experience, very few people own a saving, living faith without heartfelt, without a heart felt desire for the truth. As Christian parents, we gift our children with knowledge of God, but we cannot give them commitment. We cannot give them a love for God. We cannot give them our faith. We can teach them of God and we can model these virtues for them. But their salvation is between them and God. Jesus says, seek and you will find. And that's a promise. This is what the wise men did, and this is what we must do. The other thing wise, the wise do is they seek after knowledge. Knowledge is truth, and the truth will set you free. The wise men sought information before their journey, which pointed them in the right direction. West to Jerusalem, the land of the Jews. They also sought information on their journey. They inquired as they went, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? And note that they asked someone who didn't know, Herod, who led them to those who did, the religious leaders, the priests, the scribes. No doubt their question in the city of Jerusalem led them to Herod's palace. It's amazing how God does what he does when we start seeking. The other thing that the wise do is they worship those who are worthy of worship. The unwise worship that which is unworthy of worship. 
I've never seen an, an American idol yet who is worthy of worship. I've seen some very excellent musicians and entertainers, but I've never seen an American idol who is worthy to be worshipped. In going to the house, the wise men saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down. I, that seems weird to me. I don't know. I can't imagine myself walking into a house, seeing a baby, and falling on my face. Okay? And that's probably my problem. But they fell down and they worshipped that baby. Worship demands a worthy subject. <laughs> when these wise men saw Jesus, their very first inclination was to fall upon their faces before the infant. Why? Were there some royal guards there to, in, uh, you know, to enforce court propriety? All who enter here must bow before the king. Was that the case? No, they just showed up at the, at the baby's house and his mom was home. They were compelled due to the presence of this divine child. They sensed it. They knew it. They knew him before they met him. Worship was the only sensible and appropriate response when one comes face to face with God. Interestingly, too, these Gentiles seemed to get it like no one else at that time, except the shepherds, perhaps. Let me say that the only real Jesus that is worthy of our praise and worship, well, let me, let me back up. I need to say that again. Let me say that there is only one real Jesus who is worthy of our praise and worship. And sadly, we're living in a day and age where false Christs are being lifted up as if they are the true Son of God, and they are not. These false Jesuses are simply gods made in man's image that people feel more comfortable with than the real Jesus. Any Jesus who refuses grace and mercy to the broken and the penitent sinner is no real Jesus. Okay? Any Jesus who blesses sin is not a real Jesus. Don't go anywhere where they worship a Jesus that blesses sin. Any Jesus who violates or confuses the clear teaching of his own words is not the real Jesus. Any Jesus who presents himself as one of a number of options that can lead people to God is not a real Jesus. What did Jesus say? I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through The real and only Jesus worthy of our praise and worship, the true Son of God, is the Jesus of the Bible. He is the word of life. He hates sin in any form or function. The pain he bore because of it was unspeakably, excruciatingly horrid. Why in the world would Jesus hate sin so much? First of all, it destroys the people that he loves. Second of all, he had to bear the pain of all that sin. He forgives. The real Jesus does. The real Jesus offers mercy. The real Jesus offers grace. And it doesn't matter who you are or what you've done. There is no sin, though, that he condones or takes lightly. Jesus loves the sinners and willingly died so that they could live with him and the Father. But the worship... Uh, but worship uh, of the true Jesus bears no impurities. And the true Jesus bears no impurities. The, the second thing that worship demands is a humble heart. A humble heart. Hearts that are prideful and self-sufficient rarely bend the knee unless they are forced. And God forces no one into himself. It is against the nature of the prideful people to come to Christ. Many of us in this room, including myself, found that we had to be broken by this world. 
until we realized that in and of ourselves, we were insufficient. We had no reason to seek him. But brokenness, pain, and loneliness, and insufficiency, and despondency brought us to a place where we began to look for help from someone greater than ourselves who could actually save us from ourselves. And in our humility, we found him. In our humility, we bowed before him, and we worshiped him. Lastly, worship demands sacrifice. Worship that costs us nothing is cheap, and it mocks God. And I think we need to first note the order of things, because a lot of people bring their gifts first, and maybe sometime later, their hearts get humble. It's always a problem. Humble hearts will lead to proper sacrifice, proper gift giving. First, the wise men bowed down in humble contrition before their king, and only after they did this did they offer their gifts. Psalm 51 speaks of this. This is a psalm we find King David confessing his sins before the Lord. His heart is not right, it is not pure, so before he gave his sacrifice, he made his heart right. And listen to his words. For you will not delight in sacrifice, nor will I give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. Why not? He goes on in verse 17. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. And then one verse later he explains, then you will delight in right sacrifices, in burnt offerings, and whole burnt offerings. The bowls will be offered on your altar. We can't buy God off with offerings. <laughs> if we give God something that is worth nothing, what has he received? Nothing. <laughs> How much do you think God values nothing? Well, just as much as you do. If we give God gifts only to receive something in return, we have not given a gift, we have given him a bribe, playing him for a fool. And then who is the fool? If we give nothing to God that does not communicate to him, uh, if we give nothing to God, doesn't that commu communicate to him about our opinion of his worth? Words and worth are nothing without actions. Faith is worth nothing without deeds. Offerings that cost us nothing mock God. The wise men gave Jesus their minds through their study. The wise men gave Christ the Christ child their time and their wealth through their travel. The wise men brought their humble hearts first, then their wealth, their gold, their frankincense, and myrrh. Uh, and the wealth uh, they gave furthered God's work on earth through his son Jesus. And the kingdom went forth because of the gifts they had given. Now, a message like this brings, offers us a number of questions. First of all, have you come to a point in your life where you have discovered your insufficiency, or do you believe that you can stand alone when it comes to eternity? And ask yourself, how are you going to get to heaven without Christ? How are you going to get to heaven without God? How are you going to withstand the pressures of this world without him? Have you begun seeking the one true God who promises to be found if one will seek him? There's no time constraints on this, by the way. In my life, I have known people who found Jesus and ran from him and then stumbled and eventually turned back to him. I would say in my own life, I ran several times. Others I have known started looking for Jesus in their mid-70s and found him soon afterwards. Others looked for Jesus for years, years, and their journey, in their journey they passed through legalism in the church, they passed through atheism, they passed through various forms of skepticism, some passed through Buddhism, some passed through liberal Protestantism, some passed through works theologies, and all of them in those areas found empty promises. 
But eventually, they found the love of Jesus. And in him, they found their redemption. Once you think you've found him, what do you do? Talk to him. And I don't mean to simplify this, but talk to him. He hears you. He is a person, not an inanimate force in the universe. He hears you. He knows you. He loves you. He knows you better than you know yourself. Talk to him. Remember that God desires to relate to you as a generous and a patient and a loving father. You may not have had one of those, but that's what God is. He wants you to believe that he exists and to draw close to him and to trust him. He desires to live in you and you in him. He is a personal God. You don't need a pastor or a priest to talk to him for you. He will hear your prayers. Tell him everything, not for his sake. He already knows you better than you know yourself. He created you. He loves you. Every evil thought and deed you've ever had or done was placed on his son, Jesus. He's aware of all of those things. Any anger God may have harbored against you because of your sin, no matter how evil and insidious it might have been, is gone. It is paid for. And it is no more. Separated from you as far as the east is from the west after you trust in him. So confess those things and ask forgiveness and you will be forgiven. A humble and a contrite heart, he will not turn away. And finally, follow him. Follow him all the days of your life. If you do, you will dwell in the house of the Lord. How long? Forever. Forever. That's quite a promise. The church doesn't take the place of God. We're here to help you on your journey to the best of our ability, but we are flawed because we're full of sinful human beings who have been saved by grace, but we will do our best. Well, we would like to think we do our best. We are not God. But love, we love him too, and we know him, and we exist to make him known. Would you stand and pray with me? Gracious Father, I just ask your blessing on those who are gathered here this morning. For those of us who know you, Lord, may it be our goal in the coming year to know you better so that we can better represent you and your word in this world. And Lord, for those who are seeking you, Lord, may you just encourage them on their journey. May you put people like us into their lives that will encourage them also. May this be the year of their salvation. May this be the year that they hear your voice calling them. May they understand your love and know that the only rational response would be to return that love and give their lives to you. What a great God you are. We give you thanks. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.